Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Growers & Co. One of the most exciting developments in recent years is that, thanks to Jean-Martin Fortier, the market gardener, there is now a clothing, tool, and apparel company that was built for exactly the type of work we talk about on this show. I know that I have personally grown somewhat tired of looking through workwear websites and catalogs built for fishing or carpentry to find what I need for market gardening. So I was thrilled when Growers & Co. came to fruition and even more thrilled when I tried their clothing. They have done an absolutely excellent work. Their clothing is well-made and well-fitted. The tools are designed by growers and made to last. There is also a magazine that Growers & Co. is putting out twice per year with a focus on small-scale farming. They have a straw hat that I'm a little obsessed with. Not gonna lie, I talk about it all the time. It's on the cover of my book. Anyway, follow Growers & Co. on Instagram and all the platforms and check out what they have to offer over at growers.co. Today's show is also brought to you by Farmers Web. Farmers Web software gives you the tools you need to manage your entire sales process. Built specifically for farmers' needs, Farmers Web helps you save time, reduce errors, increase efficiency, and provides flexibility for working seamlessly with your whole customer base. Our free account includes features for sharing your real-time and coming soon product availability, as well as the option to create an availability calendar to inform buyers about your product's seasonality. Free accounts also include access to Farmers Web's how-to guides, offering pro tips and best practices on selling online to individual buyers, as well as how to work with such buyers as restaurants, schools, and stores. A one-month free trial is available for the paid account, which includes all features to manage customers and orders, including accepting online credit card sales, handling advanced pickup or delivery orders, giving select buyers special pricing and payment terms, tracking your buyer's payments, keeping detailed sales records, and much more. Even manage orders and payments for buyers not placing their orders online. Request a demo and learn more at FarmersWeb.com. Big thanks to our show sponsors. All right, let's jam. Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Episode 16, Season 3. It has been on my list for a long time now to chat with the folks over at Rodale to see what's been going on, especially in the vegetable department. Um, and so I got on the line with their farm manager in Kutztown, PA, Dan Kemper. And we had a lot of fun talking about their production, but also many of the trials they have going on from comparing different garlic mulches to animal integration. We also discuss how he and his team coordinate with many researchers and field studies that are going on. Um, Dan's biology background, we'll talk about that a bit, and a whole lot more. Super fun episode. First, if you have not pre-ordered a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, the No-Till Grower's Guide to Ecological Market Gardening, which is my new book from Chelsea Green, no worries. But I will say that now is a great time to do it. Those sales at notillgrowers.com have been amazing and they are helping us to determine what our creative budget looks like for the year. But that's only if you buy it from notillgrowers.com. If you are internationally based, just hit up your local bookshop or bookshop.org uh, for a copy because the shipping is wild. But the proceeds from the sales through notillgrowers.com all go to making you more content. So go to notillgrowers.com and pre-order it now. Books ship in July. Patreon discounts do apply. That was a little rhymy. Anyway, enough for me. Let's get into this amazing conversation with Dan Kemper of the Rodale Institute in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Dan Kemper, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. So um, I thought first we could just start with a little bit of an overview of Rodale. Uh, where kind of give us like the general rundown of what size Rodale is operating on, um, kind of where it's located for people who don't know, and then maybe a little bit about what you do there. I'd be happy to, yeah. Um, so the property that I manage is in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's 333 acres of certified land. Uh, we are a research and education institute, so we have uh, you know, PhD researchers here doing work in the fields that our farm ops team helps uh, accomplish. Um, we've got consultation program. We've got a farmer training education program. Um, 
really just trying to be the movement forward in our community and, and the nation uh, for the organic movement. Um, my job, like I said, I'm farm manager here, and so I oversee the entire property. Um, I am responsible for executing the plans that research gives me. Um, I manage our farm team, so our greenhouse managers and livestock technicians, and uh, just keep the ball moving on a daily basis. And then uh, my other hat is as the program manager for farmer training, as I mentioned. So um, I recruit interns each year. Uh, I teach them how, farming skills and how to farm and uh, hopefully set them up for a nice future and career in farming. So uh, those are my big responsibilities here, and that's kind of our property. Nice. Talk a little bit about more about what your job is on the farm management side. Um, like, what does the day-to-day -day work look like? Are you working with researchers? Are you just kind of focused on production? And what does that look like a little bit? Well, um, luckily, I get to work with everyone, which uh, is a blessing and a curse sometimes. Uh, I'm definitely responsible for just about everything that's on here. If someone needs a, a field plowed up for their research plot, that's to me and my team to accomplish. Um, we're, we have our own production fields, but on, I mean, any given day, it could be anything that's going on. We have meetings throughout the week, always planning for the future, uh, dealing with issues right now, putting out fires, you know, making lemonade out of lemons, constantly my job. <laughs> um, for the most part, just really executing plans and uh, preparing for events on the property. A uh, ton of work, just making everything look beautiful. Like a, we want this to look like a farm in the middle of a golf course. Right. Okay. So on the production area, like how big is that for, um, for vegetable production? We have about seven or eight acres of vegetables in production, four high tunnels and two greenhouses. Um, that's our, that's the majority of our vegetable production. We do have a vegetable research plot called the vegetable systems trial. That's about three acres of side-by-side -side conventional and organic uh, production techniques so that they can kind of measure the nutrient density and the soil health between conventional typical agriculture and organic agriculture in a systems trial. Okay. So with the research stuff, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Um, are you, you, you mentioned maybe having to plow up a plot or something if a researcher asks you, mm -hmm. but are you also, do they say like, Hey, can you cultivate the broccoli too? Is it something like that you're doing all their field management as well? That's correct. So everything that they need, um, you know, PhDs are responsible for creating experiments, uh, seeking funding for those experiments, uh, ana data analysis, collecting data, all the things that go to that. And our skills and expertise are in, the actual field work of creating their canvas to make their beautiful painting on it, essentially. So when they have an idea, they come to us, we consult them with uh, keeping it realistic, like what the time schedule is for planting a certain crop. Uh, we consult with those types of things when we can plow, when we can't plow. Um, and then we go through that. So whatever their plan is, how you know, many ever years it's going to be, it could be three years, five years, it could just be an indefinite project like BSD, like I mentioned, where it's just constantly happening every year. Um, yeah, it's a constant job, constant labor, uh, constant consultation. <laughs> uh, yeah, every day. Wow. That's so fascinating. And then you're also managing the production plots, which involves a CSA as well. Is that, can you describe that a little bit? Like where the vegetables go? Yeah, absolutely. So to clarify our most of just about a hundred percent of our vegetable production is through our farmer training program. And so the interns that come on are responsible for managing that area under my supervision. So um, it's kind of one of the same between the education and the production. Everything that we do here is a reason we don't just grow something to grow it. Uh, there's always another uh, reason to do that. So the vegetables are pretty much for farmer training, but we also have, like you said, the CSA and a farmer's market that we kind of distribute the beautiful vegetables that we grow, as well as the livestock that we grow here. and uh, so the CSA is 100 people this year. We're always, you know, dancing around that number of CSA members to try to stay manageable in an education system, but also profitable so that we're maintaining our business. Um, and then we have one or two farmers markets this year. I think maybe three, actually. We have a few pop-up markets. Um, you can visit our site to know more about where we're distributing and applying for CSA stuff. And after that, it's kind of just custom order. People call in all the time to ask if they can get, you know, 15 pounds of bacon and two heads of cabbage or something. And so we'll fill those orders all the time. That's pretty much where all of our food goes. 
And you said the high tunnels, and forgive me if you said this, are, are you going year round? We are, yeah. So we're going to be, we do greens right now. We've got a ton of beautiful spinach growing that we've been harvesting for some of our local uh, grocery stores, actually. Uh, we have a few, you might call host at wholesale accounts. You know, we're not filling truckloads over here, but um, we're moving a good amount and keeping our community uh, with beautiful greens on their dinner plate. Okay. And is that nonprofit as well? Like is the like Rodale as an, as an institute is all nonprofit. Is the vegetable side nonprofit as well? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's still the same company. So we're still operating within a nonprofit. Um, we are essentially, uh, how do you say, we're kind of just adding on to the cost of the production and farmer training program. So we never want to be losing money, but um, we're not raking it in, so to say. And we're also reaching out to people that, might have difficulty with paying all of the CSA up front and letting them pay weekly. So we're, you know, as, as always, we're never looking for yield at the final bottom of everything. We always take into consideration implications of our practices and what production might cost. And so it's not always going to be the perfect business model, so to say, where it's the highest possible profit, but that's not really the point. And we're accomplishing other goals by, um, you know, not being the most profitable as possibly can just to make sure that we're being inclusive. Okay. So give us a little bit of a more detail on this farmer, uh, farmer training program. Like what is it, how does it work and what does it look like? Yeah, I'd be happy to tell you about that. So our farmer training program is called the RIFT program, which stands for Rodale Institute Farmer Training. And it is a multi-track program that actually goes for more than one year for in some cases where we try, to, we try to include everyone we possibly can to give them as much information as they can on farming to create as many farmers uh, as we can. And that's really the bigger goal here is to create as many organic farmers. And so over about 10 years, this program's kind of molded and twisted and turned a bit. And now here what we have is essentially a very formalized collegiate style education with four semesters through the year, um, weekly lectures in the field, weekly lectures in the classroom, homework assignments, quarterly exams, um, and just, you know, once they graduate, access to our alumni network and access to all the great minds at Rodale. So we've really upgraded this to be a very formalized system. And even now we're starting to pilot uh, remote programs, virtual programs, so we can reach people across the entire world. What, how many students are in this involved in this program? Um, well, this year, so that always depends on funding. As a nonprofit, you know, we're always looking for uh, partners that help us uh, move forward our mission. And so it's always been a limit of who I can pay to come here and work on the property. And that's great. I'm, I'm here to pay people for their labor and that's everything. But, you know, that limits to me to maybe six or seven people per year for the entire season. And, you know, I always pour everything I can into these people, but I want to reach out to more. And so this year, it's going to be six new first-year interns. We're going to have one second-year intern returning. Um, the second-year internship is for management and financial skills and how to open a business. Because, again, the goal here is to open farms and keep them profitable. Um, and then we're going to start bringing on maybe three or four people for a remote or educational-only program uh, where they would pay us a tuition to come in, do no labor get all of the lecture time, all of the uh, homework assignments and curriculum, and uh, get a certificate of completion at the end for the professional portfolio. Okay, so for that latter example, you hadn't been doing that before. This is a new thing where you're going to start having people that can come in and pay for the education and not necessarily do the labor? Yeah, it's brand spanking. New. We're just doing it this year. That's cool. Okay, so and then you said that the interns, this is a paid program. Like that, that the interns that come or have been coming – those six or so people, they get a salary or yeah, they get paid by the hour and they come in and they work about 40 to 45 hours. And they're essentially the like architects of these, of this program. They're the ones that um, go out and do the transplanting under my supervision and coaching. Um, they're taking all the classroom time that they can. We're having these long lectures and discussions in the field. And they're really, they're the ones that I'm guaranteeing we're going to be a farmer in two years or less. Right. Okay. So they're, I'm just curious, like in terms of how that's funding, how the funding works out, you're not getting, you're not able to pay for all six of those employees through the vegetable production or. That's correct. So, yeah, so we have, we have our whole farm ops team that act as the educators here, including myself. And so we're going through teaching these interns how to farm while they 
assist us in helping create this production to create the vegetables. The vegetables go out through our food access programs and go out to different kind of impoverished areas, if you will, uh, trying to reach out to these food deserts if we can. And, um, you know, kind of completing the, the network of creating people that create farms that will go out to these areas and upgrade whole food, whole food systems. So the, that's, that's basically the idea behind it. And then the money that we make off of vegetable sales essentially is helping us with that. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, before we move on from that subject, mm-hmm. how do people, like if somebody was interested in doing that, how do they do that? How do they get involved? Yeah. So right now, um, I actually just finished and filled the position for 2021. So we had an enormous influx this year of applications, almost 100 people applied. Um, I had to sort through all of that, screen them down to six people. And so uh, we'll be inviting six full season people on uh, beginning of March. That'll be here through November. Okay, right on. Um, All right. So now I kind of want to get into some of the field stuff because I know that you all have a lot of different stuff going on. Um, So let's talk you know, I, I know that Jeff Moyer has done a lot of work on the sort of roller crimping stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a big part of your production method in the vegetable gardens? Like, are you doing a lot of roller crimping? So the, the vegetables are very finicky. So um, we are experts at corn and soy no-till. Um, our, our row crop uh, rotation is very efficient. Our cultivating for row crops and no-till is very efficient. The vegetables, however... Um, it's, it's a different beast. It's a different timing schedule, um, different tools, different precision. So we're still, we're still working out the kinks and experimental plots with that. So I have a few experimental areas. Our research department always has lots of experiments with, uh, no fill replicates in their, in their plots. So we're, we're, you know, full steam ahead on figuring out the perfect way to do that. And we do have a few vegetables figured out. Um, but for the farmer training side, uh, we're not doing the full production in no-till, just smaller areas, like maybe a, a third of an acre here and a half an acre there. Okay. Talk a little bit about those. What are, what's the kind of, what are some production methods that you've seen of, to be effective in the, in the sort of more no and low-till methods? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like you mentioned, the roller crimper is one of the no-till methods that we're trying out where you kind of roll down a cover crop. Uh, you let it grow up until it flowers to the point where it's easy to kill it by crimping the stem. And that's the idea behind the roller crimper. Um, you put that on the front and you put a seeder on the back. It's very easy to do. So this year we had a green bean patch that went on for, I don't know, like five weeks longer than a traditional tilled uh, green bean patch. And we are taking soil sample data from that. It's only been a year or two in that plot, so we don't have anything to show yet. But I can say that that production was was nuts in the no-till area for the green bean. Uh, the other time, the other technique that we tried is tarping, and so tarping is the idea of not disturbing the soil, but to smother it with a big, big tarp, well, plastic tarp, impenetrable uh, tarp that will essentially not let anything uh, photosynthesize. And if you get the right temperature, the worms and bacteria and fungus and whatnot break down everything on the surface. And when you pull it off, it looks like you just killed, but you didn't. So all the aggregate stability is still there, but you, uh, you know, decayed everything on top so you can start fresh. And so our no-till plot and our tarp plot are right next to each other. And we are doing a long-term study seeing the effects on the soil from those two types of techniques long-term. Okay, so we like to get into the nerdy details here. So maybe jump back and give us that bean rundown. So was that, were those beans following rye? Like what was that? How did, can you kind of go back and give us the, what cover crop preceded them and and those sort of details? Sure. So the way that it happened is that we started this regenerative organic certification. So in the regenerative organic certification, a gold standard means that you do not kill the soil um, for, more often than once every three years. So what I'm looking for is permanent no-till or at least every three years. So this started uh, last year, which means that the year before is when I prepped for it. So by prepping for it, I came out of a winter squash field. The winter squash field was harvested in two phases. So we're starting off as not a perfect experiment, but that kind of happens when you don't have funding. So the winter squash came off. I put rye and vetch on one side. 
to get a bit of a legume going there. And it also, you know, fetch acts like kind of like this big Velcro piece. So when you roll it, it's this big, beautiful mat that really smothers well. Um, and I knew I was going with green beans, and I know that you're not supposed to do that, but I wanted to go for it anyway. Uh, the other side that was a later harvest, uh, it was too late to put in a legume, so that got straight rye. And so the rye side grew up through the winter, well, both sides grew up through the winter, and then the rye side got tarp, and the green bean, I mean, the, the vet side got roller cream. And both of them got green beans in it. And so it was the same seeding date, same varieties, and I guess what well, that kind of shows first and foremost, it wasn't part of the point, but just the, you know, I would say the, the nitrogen that comes from the vetch really helped the green beans, even though they're already a legume, uh, the tart side kind of uh, didn't make it after the first few harvests. They got kind of yellow, full of holes. Um, we saw some bean damage in both sides, but I would say that the tart side just completely died after the third harvest, whereas the roller crimp side stayed for, I would say, at least five more harvests. We were selling probably 30 pounds of green beans at every farmer's market, just clearing it out. Um, tell me when to stop on the nuts and bolts and details. <laughs> no, you. I mean, as many of those details, I love it, as many of those details as possible. In fact, I think that comment about the vetch being like Velcro um, is a cool observation because I've kind of noticed the same thing where, where vets just kind of grabs onto stuff and then it mats really easily. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a cool observation. What variety of green bean was that? It was a provider, our typical bush bean. I wanted, I wanted to start off with something that was super easy and, uh, we have a monosem planter where every, everywhere we go with no-till, uh, corn and soil, we use this big old, um, 30 inch row monosem four row planter. And so I wanted this first year to be really easy for me. So I used that with green beans. Um, this coming year, we have tomatoes going in. So um, before we get off of that plot, there's another component to that that I thought is very interesting, and uh, it's animal integration. So if you can imagine it, we have two perfect squares next to each other. One of the squares gets roller crimp, and one of the squares gets um, tarp. If you you can imagine a line going longitudinally through those squares where the northern half of both squares is separated from the southern half of both squares. We put poultry through the northern half of both of those plots. And so now we have essentially four different treatments, no replicates, uh, still not a big experiment. So um, don't compare this to our legitimate PhD research that we do on the property that's multi-year, but um, this is my little trial. And so we put chickens through there to scratch it up put their manure down, pick up some of the weed seeds, and then um, we put our cover crop in after them. So next year, we're going to do the same thing. And I'm hoping that I can see a trend, not just in the soil samples that we're taking from each treatment, but I'm hoping to see a real uh, demonstration and a real difference in production where I can bring people on and show them the different treatments and show how uh, you know, some no-till works better than others. You're, you're not leaving permanent or semi-permanent beds, right? Like you're kind of changing it up every year? Yeah, they're going to be planted essentially on the same spacing. So because of the roller crimping system, I'm going to go through with the monosem on the back and use it to mark my rows so I still have perfect spacing. So I am looking on planting in the same spot each year, but it's not going to be a bed system by any means. It's, 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 I'm hoping the whole point is to make this somewhat scalable or to show that it can be done on more than just a third of an acre. And so the roller crimper is like, you know, that's made for, you could do that on tens of thousands of acres if you wanted to. It's literally one pass the tractor. Uh, the tarping obviously has its limit, um, but I wanted to show grander scale than what I could accomplish on that one little plot. So everything is on a field system, not a bed system. Okay. So with that roller crimper, is the roller crimper on the front and the cedar is on the back? Yeah. Are you doing that simultaneously? Yes. Okay. And... And I think you said this, but how wide is that cedar? So it's like well, our field passes with the tractor. The roller crimper is about 10. The cedar should be fitting 10. Our cultivators are on for 10. Okay, that makes sense. Is there anything else about that plot you wanted to mention? Um, I'm, I'm hoping to do both the green beans and tomatoes and maybe sweet corn. Um, and then and just to continue to be nerdy, I'm hoping that there's some way I can think about doing potatoes. I think that'd be cool to, because that would be kind of like where I could disrupt the no-till if I wanted to do not permanent no-till and I wanted to reset it, but still not decimate everything. 
uh, that would kind of flatten things out a little bit. Um, but, you know, potatoes are always a hard thing for anyone to do. You know, any root crop is difficult to think about doing no-till, uh, but I would like to try that. So um, just to tell you my what I'm going to go for. Yeah, I like that. So the next crop is going to be tomatoes then? Yes. So what's in there right now? Is it uh, another cover crop? Yeah, there's a triticale in there right now. Okay, so then what's the approach going to be for the tomatoes? Are you going to do kind of the same thing, tarp on one side, roller crimp on the other? How's that going to go? Yep, exactly the same. So I want to show the, I want to go as long as I can to show the production styles and, you know, long-term benefits of the roller crimp no-till and of the tarping no-till. Um, I'm also looking for shortcomings, you know, like what, at what year does this kind of tap out or is this not usable or is there a limit to either of them? Um, should we keep doing that over and over again with a vegetable production? What's the transplant method for those tomatoes? Like, is there a, do you have a transplanter or is it something you do by hand? So we do have a transplanter, but it's a very, it's a no-till transplanter. It's essentially a modified tobacco planter with a carousel. And so it has a lot of more like kind of trench making, digging pieces, cutting pieces on the front to get through that big mat of roll down. Um, but that's really made for long, long passes on the field. Uh, it's not made for the tiny little plot that I have with quick turnarounds and make sure you don't hit the high tunnel next to it and the tarp. So we're going to just mark the beds and then go in there by, by hand. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this big, like kind of cast iron, uh, shume, hori hori knife, uh, trowels with the kind of blade on the side of it, they're really heavy duty. And so you just smash that into the ground and wiggle it around so you can get a hole and put the plant in, cover it up carefully, and then you're good to go. We're going to do it on two foot spacing and a five foot uh, centers of the bed. Oh, is that hori hori? Is that on a long stick? Like, is it a, does it got a, does it have a long handle or you're doing that just, or is it just like a regular, I, when I think of a hori hori, I think of almost like a trowel. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a trowel, and it's a straight piece of metal that like, has like a, a full tang on it. And so whereas the stuff I get from the stores, if I use like a traditional trowel from the store with that little tiny neck on it, and I try to put it in a no-till plot and wriggle around, I break it. And so that hori hori knife is really, really helpful uh, with digging in there. You can hit that thing with a hammer, and it won't break, man. I'm telling you, it's, it's the thing to use when you have tough ground to go into. Yeah, that's awesome. This last, this past year, we did we did some crimping and did uh, we had a uh, auger bit on a drill, and that was like our oh, there you go. that was our yeah that was our approach, and that was pretty effective. Um, I burned out one drill, but I, I got a brushless <laughs> one that I think that that seems to be working a lot better. Okay, so tomatoes, um, you're doing a pretty decent size amount of field tomatoes then is that are you can you talk a little bit about how you're trellising those are you doing those all sort of florida weave mm -hmm. yeah so i like uh you know i talk to so many people from so many different places that the lingo is always so different between basket weave florida weave and stuff like that um we go you know around the pole once down to the next pole down to the next pole uh, and then we make kind of like a box uh, between where the tomatoes are. We're not, we're not weaving in between individual tomatoes. Some people um, describe that as a basket or a Florida weave. So we're not weaving them individually. We're just going around them. The, the stakes are about four plants apart, so about eight feet apart. And uh, we're trellising them as they grow. We're not setting them up and training them, and we're not pruning in the field. We only prune in the high school. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, w we've kind of done sort of the uh sort of not the opposite necessarily, but we will do the weave when they're, when they're low. And then as they get higher, as they get taller, then we'll just go from pole to pole, pole and not necessarily go in between the plants. Gotcha. But gotcha. you're just going, you're just going from pole to pole the whole, the whole time. It's probably, I mean, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work for the most part. Yeah. Um, it, it, does, it does help them slump a little bit. They do slump because the, the, we have a lot of wind, but I'm finding that, um, I, I did experiment with it just one time. I can't speak to lots of experience with that um, individual weave, but um, I was kind of like girdling them. That was kind of ripping away the vascular tissue because of all of the wind that I got. A few of them actually mm. snapped, and I'm not sure. Maybe I did it too tight, um, but it wasn't as, it wasn't as successful to me, or it was a little bit harsher on the plant than the than just the box weave or the around the around the from pole to pole. Yeah, interesting. Um... Okay. And we, you touched on animal integration a little bit. Is there, are you doing any other sort of animal integration? Yeah, we're doing tons of it. So, um, I have, 
I have two separate rotations for our vegetable field uh, to go along with our education. It's more of a regenerative living cover crop integration wholesale scale of three acres, and then more of an intensive farmer's market CSA. Everything's thrown together, no living cover uh, production style. So in the three acres with the living cover, we essentially we essentially skip every other bed with production and put in uh, Dutch white clover. And so we have alternating five foot beds of production and cover crop. And that does a few things for us. That's building our soil constantly in all three acres all year. Uh, it makes a really easy drive lane for harvesting. Um, it's really easy for spraying if you wanna do that. And then it really opens up the tomatoes and um, reduces the kind of, um, I guess you could say the disease pressure from being kind of stagnant and the air kind of just sitting there, uh, we open them up. So there's a few great things going on there. And then in, in that production, we have sweet potatoes and sweet corn as one unit in one acre. And so when that comes off and we rip the plastic out, we put turkeys in. And that's the perfect timing for Thanksgiving. So we integrate turkeys into that rotation. Um, legumes, turkey manure, and compost are the only uh, fertility components of that entire production style, and we really crank out numbers. I don't have compiled numbers in front of me for you, uh, unfortunately, but um, we're not we're not hurting in those fields. Okay, so you have these fields, and they are basically entirely in um, Dutch white clover. Yeah. And bef- so let's say you're getting ready to plant sweet potatoes. Can you kind of and you mentioned the plastic? Can you kind of describe that process? Sure. So, um, like I said, we're not we're we're still tilling in these fields, and so we essentially have um, alternating beds throughout all three acres that are I w- they're treated differently. I'll say so. Uh, it, it's hard to say that because the whole field is treated as one unit, but because of the, the alternating style, they are treated differently. So, the clover strips, the five foot clover strips, will go a whole year. They'll be mowed, walked on, turkeys rotated through. They'll be tilled in the spring and prepped for beds of whatever it's going to be that year. And I do use plastic up there. It's a decent production method. It keeps the heat on them like I need. Um, We experiment with leaf mulch side by side. I'll just make a side note and uh, show the difference there. But uh, for this conversation, I'll just say that the plastic beds that we lay are then used for the production and the clover grows next to that, which was the cash crop last year. So even though we're rotating three acres, each year inside of those acres we're rotating beds by flipping them so we're really uh benefiting from what that clover is doing for an entire year in the cash crop next year okay wait wait before we move on the leaf mold do you see a big difference between the leaf mold and the plastic yeah so um obviously leaf mulch is uh, easy to till in it does a good job of smothering weeds um i will say that it does not get the same heat on the plant and so the plant stays a little bit smaller um, it's a really great method. If you don't want to spend the money on plastic or if you're against plastic, leaf mulch is a really great way to go. Um, it's, we get it free from our municipality. And there's a really good chance that if your municipality collects leaves, uh, they're looking to get rid of it. They probably don't have space for it. And so they will literally drop it off in your property for free if you ask them. And we use that. You know, We slightly compost it, turn it a little bit, um, pick the trash out if there is any, and then we use it on our field with mulch. Okay, that's cool. Um, so the this is more of a kind of strip tillage method, um, mm-hmm. and which is cool. I think like for for like really large acreage, especially like this is definitely something people should be looking at because I think um, we've had other people on. Helen Atow was one that she talked a lot about strip tillage, and and David Blanchard is another one for people who are interested in it. Um, that is a that can be a really effective method, especially when coupled with the with the clover. Are you doing anything in terms of like um, ruminant grazing? Like you mentioned, the two fowl, the chicken and the turkeys. Um, what about ruminants? Are you ever integrating them as well? Um, ruminants are on the horizon. We are getting there uh, right now. We have poultry and swine, and so we've actually been rotating pigs through some of our croplands. So um, we've been so we have, say, imagine we have a pasture, we'll no-till corn into that pasture, they'll all grow up, and then we'll put pigs through there, we'll mob graze them so they knock everything down and tear it up, so it's essentially killing it, and then we'll come in there with a cover crop afterwards. 
and then plan to do the same thing either over and over again through the year or through the different seasons. And uh, we just hired a new livestock technician, Baylor Lansden, who's showing a lot of promise and has a lot of really cool plans for his uh, uh, pig rotating plan. Okay, when you let the pigs in there, this is always the question I have. How do you deal with the sort of mounding and the wallowing? Are you rotating them really quickly? Or are you just giving them a lot of space? No, we so um, we had side by side one, another one of our quick little trials. No replicates, but just tried it out. We put um, we had similar size paddocks, well, actually the exact same size paddocks. We put nine of them in one paddock and seventeen in the other. The ones that were in the nine. Uh, the, the group of nine took a really long time to knock the corn down. They wallowed up a lot. They actually pushed so much dirt up that they knocked the fence down and were able to get out. Um, that was a huge issue. The group of 17 just flattened the whole area so quickly that we moved them out, and we realized that there was maybe two wallows that were less than, like, two inches deep. Um, you know, if you're going to put pigs through, uh, it is, you know, you've got to be on top of it and make sure they're not there for too long. You've got to put enough in there to knock down not let them hang out for too long um, and then move them on and then see right behind them. How long did it take for them to knock that area down? Uh, uh, without having the numbers for their days in the rotation right in front of me, I can't say that it was more than more than a week of them in there. Maybe a little, maybe it was definitely under two weeks. It might've been a week and a few days. Um, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah, I think that's really interesting. The idea of it's more of a mob grazing technique where you're packing them in a little bit tighter so that they have more impact really quickly, but it's maybe less impact on compaction and wallowing and those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. You keep them interested. Um, you have something fun for them like peas and oats or corn or beets or radishes. Uh, they'll go nuts. They'll tear the whole thing up. They have so much fun out there. And then you just hurry up and get them out of that area before where they start really digging in and rooting up too much. What is, are you doing any sort of like um, compost mulch trials? Or are you doing anything like that? Um, not, not as a mulch. Um, you know, I, I find I, I've seen people try that before. And I think that um, I think that it can be effective. And I think as a good way of incorporating compost, uh, I wouldn't say that it's really my style. Um, I really like, I really like to mix the compost into the soil and really make sure it's, ubiquitous through the soil and evenly distributed and stuff. So I do like to do uh, some, some light, I would say, not deep tillage just for incorporating uh, compost. Uh, mulching stuff, I've, I've tried different colors of plastic. I've tried leaves, straw. Uh, we usually do a trial with our garlic between straw and leaves to see which one does better. Um, what else do we try? I've tried planting into growing things. Um, I'm not an expert in planting directly into it, it seems like the whatever's growing there before uh, consumes whatever I put in there, no matter what it is. Wait, what, what's, the, what's the deal with the trial with the garlic and the straw and leaves trial? What, how does that, what if, have you observed anything from that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So I'm, so garlic, probably one of my favorite things ever. Allians are like my reason for growing and being a farmer. I love onions and garlic and everything. So I get really geeked out about garlic specifically. Um, we do side-by-side -side trials. So if I have enough garlic for, say, two whole beds of German white, I'll split them between straw mulch and leaf mulch. And so then we get to watch the differences in growth. And so what I've observed is that this, um, the straw mulch is more expensive, but it is better for the garlic. The, the leaf mulch is free, and so it's a great way to get started, but it does have its uh, shortcomings and its, its downfalls, I'll say. Um, the straw mulch essentially makes this beautiful little uh, net of a cave for the garlic. And what it does is it sprouts up just a few inches and it just sits in there. And it's very happy because light can be filtered through the straw. It doesn't mat down, so to say. It lets uh, water and light and air trickle through. So the garlic's content in there through the winter where it can fertilize. And then in the spring when it's nice, it pops up through. And uh, you have this beautiful field of garlic coming up through straw. The leaf mulch, on the other hand, kind of mats down. Um, you want it to be shredded for sure, because if you get those big sycamore and maple leaves, uh, the garlic won't be able to break through that if it really mats down. Um, to tell you a story about that, not to uh, deviate for too long, but um, I put on leaf mulch really heavy one year on all the garlic, and it started coming up. Um, and I noticed that like half of it wasn't coming up. And I was like, what's going on? So I started moving leaf mulch around, and these big sycamore leaves were not letting the garlic through, so it coiled up like this big yellow coil of a plant underneath the leaf. 
And I was like, oh, no, I had like, a, you know, I had half an acre of garlic that was going through this. So me and one other intern in, I don't know, December or January went through and started uncovering each individual garlic plant. We were teasing it out, making sure not to break it. It was super fragile. And it took us, it took us probably, you know, two whole days, maybe two and a half days of doing just that, eight hours a day. Um, and then as soon as we finished, we got a foot of snow and it literally killed every garlic plant that I had uncovered. Um, that was wow. revolutionary, I would say, in what I think about leaf mulch and how quickly a decision can backfire and blow up right in your face. So um, my, my word of advice is to shred it. Shred the leaves. If they don't come shredded, shred them yourself or be really careful about how you put them down because uh, as someone who loves garlic, I was absolutely heartbroken when I lost half my garlic that day. Wow. So, okay. So what are you all shredding with? Are you, are they coming shredded? They come shredded. Yeah. And if it, and if it doesn't, then, you know, usually comes in truckloads at a time. So if the truck that specifically was picking it up doesn't have a shredder, you can see that in the pile of leaf mulch. And I kind of just scrape that away and don't use that. And like I said, we slightly compost it. So when we're like scooping it around and turning and stuff, it does tend to break down pretty easily. Uh, but like I said, you got to be careful with those big sycamore and maple leaves. So, so like I said, the leaf mulch, it mats down and it does not create that beautiful little habitat for the garlic to hide out in. And so the garlic thinks that that's the dirt. And so the garlic keeps growing through that even in the fall before the harsh winter you might get and exposes itself to the cold. And that's not terrible because we're just trying to keep that little growing tip down in the soil alive, not necessarily the leaves, but it's not really doing the garlic any favors by subjecting it to those uh, conditions letting the leaves die, being forced to create new leaves in the middle of the winter to continue to photosynthesize, whereas the protected ones in the straw, it, they, you know, they keep maybe two or three little tiny leaves, uh, really just a nub. Most of them are just a nub that come up uh, through the, in the straw, and then, you know, come spring, both of them do just fine. Uh, we found that the straw mulch does out yield the leaf mulch. Um, I'll, I'll say again that we did not do replicates this was not a full-on experiment. It was just simply a side-by-side trial. But we did find that the straw mulch outperformed the leaf. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Um, we've had the similar results with uh, leaf mold on on garlic, where if you put it down too thick, it just does not come through. Yeah. Um, you mentioned having a passion for onions. Do you have any onion growing tips? Oh man, yeah. So it, you know, it's going to come down to what your customer is, what size onion they want, what kinds. What they're interested in. Um, I love beautiful wine colored red onions and I love dark, spicy, copper colored storage onions. And so I kind of just geek out on varieties. I'm doing variety trials for a couple different companies on onions. Um, we, the, all of our onions are in that uh, uh, legume compost manure rotation. So um, I love that they're in that rotation. I get great onions. We do, we, we plant two per cell and then we transplant them four rows on a plastic bed. And so we're not, we're not going after the, the big boppers, like the, you know, three or four inch onions. We just like the, you know, two and a half inch maybe um, for farmer's market CSAs and then uh, wholesale to the people in our, in our area. I love growing onions for everyone. <laughs> I would say that tip wise, um, you want to incorporate your cover crop right away. Make sure you have a clean bed that you're going into. Um, do not fertilize it too late in the season. If you're going to put any fertilizer down, do it up front only. When you get towards bulbing stage, you want to have uh, very little nitrogen and you actually want to have cool soil and that reduces your bacterial infection and actually helps the onion finish better. So um, I grow my onions on silver plastic. And so silver plastic repels drips and aphids during the season. But then when it comes time to harvest in the middle of July, when it's really heating up, it's actually reflecting the light and keeping the soil a little bit cooler, um, help, helping my onion kind of finish well. And then I uh, cure it in the greenhouse and then put it into storage and it lasts for months and months and months. I'm still eating them right now. Are they covered or are they just directly like on something? They're, they're on metal, like, a, like diamond expanded metal tables. So a lot of airflow through both sides of them. We kind of line them up like a, like scales where the tops are on the, the, the green parts on the bottom and all the onions are facing up. Uh, we always have a shade cloth on our plastic, the plastic UV rated, 
And then we just let them cook in there until uh, I would say maybe two weeks, two and a half weeks before they're crispy and ready to be trimmed. And then we get our best storage that way. Okay. And then what's the storage look like? Are you trimming you? So you're trimming the greens after that or trimming what's left of the greens. Um, and then you're storing them. What does that process look like? Like what's your curing secrets? So it, mine's really easy. I mean, I, I don't think you can really mess up onions that hard. We cure them until they're, uh, the tops are crispy, which is about two and a half weeks. We trim the roots, we trim the tops, we put them into red mesh bags. We stack them up in the corner and then we put a big tarp on them. And the tarp is just kind of like a isolation from opening and closing the cooler door all the time. You really don't want any condensation on them. So putting another kind of protective layer on those is helpful. Uh, I would recommend keeping them by themselves in the tarp. We put onions and potatoes one time together under the same tarp, and it was not great. The potatoes had so much moisture because they didn't cure. And to me, I was just like, well, put all the storage stuff under the tarp. And that was a that was a bad move. So if I were you, keep the dry onions and garlic and stuff uh, separated. And is that tarp breathable? Like, is it polyethylene straight plastic or is it like woven? It's woven. It's, it's okay. the ones you get from like a, like a hardware store. It's not like brown cover loose woven. It's pretty tight weave, but it is. Yeah, that's great. Hey, you all just jumping in real quick to get a word from our sponsors like Tilth Soil. Tilth Soil makes NOP compliant living potting soils in Cleveland, Ohio with food scraps they haul and compost themselves. Each batch of soil is tested against the competitors and the results are in. Plants vote for Tilth Soil. To learn more about their full line of products, please visit www.tilthsoil.com. The show is also brought to you by you, the patrons. Our patrons at patreon.com slash no-till growers are the absolute best. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you love this show or the No-Till Flowers podcast or our videos or Growers Live, our live bi-monthly show that just got its own po- podcast feed under Growers Live, anything that we do and you want to support it, go to patreon.com slash no-till growers and consider signing up for as little as $2 a month, or you can pay for the full year. And I think you get like a two ten percent discount or something. Anyway, at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to veggie cropper, earth care farmer, Jane Murner, cynical, Asia Smith, Rimmel greenhouse systems, Scott Snodgrass, Andrew and Haley Keeler from Avoda sustainable acres, Jody Miller, Shane and Emma of Aslan organics, Tony Lopez, Clément, Thomas Eliason, Travis and Heidi of Arcadia Acres, Judson Taylor, John Mills, Grown Up Farm, Jacob Arthur, Clara Coleman, Wild Mountain Seeds, Bob and Ann Patton of Hexamshire Organics, Jared Kirst, Jay Armour, Dan Brisebois, C. Max Small, Jay McCombs, Tim Baldwin, Mark Andre Giroux, Esoterra Culinary, Steve Larson, Fiona and Donnie of Firefly Farm, Jean-Martin Fortier, Yannick Laplante, Jen Lawrence, and Dan Fort. Huge thanks to everyone who supports our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. You can also kick us a few bucks to at no-till growers on Venmo or their PayPal options you can find at no-tillgrowers.com or just purchase my new book. That kicks a bunch of money to no-till growers. So go to no-tillgrowers.com. Otherwise, let's get back to Dan. Somebody had asked one of our uh, Patreon members, we always let them ask questions. And she'd asked, uh, Sarah Ketchum had asked about whether or not you all had done any research on hornworm exclusion. Uh, I guess they're thinking of putting bird netting on the sides of and front of their high tunnels uh, to mm-hmm. keep out the moths, but don't want to deter yeah. other pollinators. Have you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that would work perfectly. And let me, let me get on my soapbox for the unsung hero of the pollinator were the fly. Uh, everyone's looking at the honeybees and they're great. And so are bumblebees. But if you go into your high tunnel, even into the exclusion, the gnats and the flies and the stuff, I mean, you know, you're going to get pollinated. And if you're really concerned about it, you can buy pollinators. Um, I'll say that I use, I, I do not have mine netted in. I do get hornworms. I pick them off. They do uh, hurt my plants and stuff. But for the pollinators, I was buying in uh, boxes of pollinators and I kind of just felt like I wasn't, it wasn't necessary, you know, uh, our whole philosophy is to, you know, see what nature has to offer here and try to fit your production into that. And buying pollinators is like, I already have all of these insects. We have lace wings and ladybugs show up every year nonstop. Uh, I already have all of this fruit. Um, I never felt the need to pollinate it. I would say that if you're really good at excluding and you really don't have anything in there at all, 
then you would have to be concerned about buying a pollinator and maybe even hand pollinate if you're really going to put that effort into it. Yeah, right. So are you doing anything to encourage flies? No, no. I, I, I open the doors. I let stuff come in. I let stuff go out. We have birds and stuff going here too. We got to chase those guys out. But um, what's really cool is just that the realization I had a few years ago when I was, you know, buying lots of insects and really trying to make nature happen, you know, it was like a, a late day and I was just closing up the high tunnels and we were, we were discussing which lacewing package we wanted to order. And I go in the high tunnel, I'm closing up and there's green lacewings everywhere. And I, I call my, uh, the, my colleague and I was like, you got to come up here. You got to check this out. There's lacewings everywhere. And you just, you know, Sometimes nature does it for you, and it's not always. You can't just trust in the earth and sky, but sometimes you don't need to do that much. Sometimes things take care of themselves, and if you just observe, you can realize where you can save yourself some time, like not buying pollinators if you realize that flies are doing the job. Right. Um, any other trials of note? Uh, let's see. Um, I just try out different production styles. Um, I've done... Uh, big winter squash field of woven ground cover and planted winter squash into that, into pretty burned holes. Uh, that was life changing. No weeds in the winter squash field. That was fantastic. I love that. Um, we're getting, we're getting good with tarping as a stale seed bed option and flame weeding. Um, we like to do basket weeding for that as well. It's just kind of a whole regimen of uh, trying to knock down those weeds in our care beds. With the, with the winter squash and the landscape fabric, are you, um, are you rolling that up and then just using it again the next year? I'm assuming. Yep. Yeah. We, uh, we take it off the field, we scrub it off. Uh, we clean it with like a bleach and like a big, uh, push broom as a scrub brush and then just roll it back up and we're going to reuse it again. Okay. And what's this? I'm curious. We never really talk about winter squash. Are you, what's your, what are your varieties and what kind of spacing are you working with? Um, I am doing, you know, I'm I'm dancing back and forth between one and a half and two foot spacing with uh, some of these varieties, and I'm I think I'm realizing that some of the varieties like a like a delicata or a busher bushier one can go on a one and a half foot spacing, and the other ones need to uh, vine out a little bit more on two foot spacing. Um, but I'm doing two plants per hole. Uh, I like I like that they kind of grow away from each other. I think that they're not competing too much. Uh, I think that it's still a good system. Some people argue, why would you just not split the space thing and do one per hole? Uh, this, this works for me, and it saves me time in the greenhouse. Um, we are not spraying for cucumber beetle. They are flowering. We, we do a later planting of winter squash. We have a summer and spring uh, cucumbers, and those guys are the ones that have started the cucumber beetle, then they move to the winter squash, and we plant those in the first week of June. And everything's flowering at that time. Um, it doesn't feel good to spray pesticides in a flowering crop. And so we essentially rely on either exclusion or trap cropping. So we will let a whole succession of summer cucumbers take on most of those cucumber beetles after they come out of production and then try to try to piece along the winter squash and not get too uh, taken down. We, we do lose a few plants every year. Uh, Winter squash is not my favorite, uh, which is why that ground cover was so uh, revolutionary because weeds, pest, fertility, uh, you know, winter squash is hands on around here, I think. What's the, you, you'd mentioned, you know, composting your leaf mulch a little bit. What is the compost situation there? Are you all doing all of your own compost? Are you importing some of it? Yeah, we do all of our own compost. So our stocks are uh, first the leaves that we've received here. That's a large piece of our stock. Then we have vegetable waste, we have landscaping waste, then we have manure and fatalities. And all of those get mixed at a certain ratio from our uh, compost expert into our normal Rodale compost. Um, sometimes we have like a, like maybe like a donation, like a, a warehouse needs to get rid of this kelp so they can clean it out and put a new product and they're just looking to get rid of it. Uh, we'll compost that, we'll put some of that into it. Uh, and then we'll have like, you know, one with a higher potassium. but for the most part, uh, it's pretty standard stuff. Um, leaf mulch as a base. We do some with manure, some without manure, depending on the experiment and project. Um, yeah, we have two big yards. Uh, we have a big windrow turner. 
um, the standard US, I, I'm not sure if it's USDA or who dictates it, but it's like uh, it reaches a certain temperature in 15 days, a certain number of turns. We do everything that we need to be able to use it on certified land. I'm not sure if you can technically certify compost organic, um, but if you could, we would. Right. It's got to be for you all to be able to use it out of the 90 and 120 day rule. It has to be NOP compliant. So it has to meet those temperatures and be turned at the right times. Yeah. If you're going to stay, I mean, I'm assuming that you can apply that compost anytime, right? Like you're not having to adhere to 90 or 120 days before the harvest, right? I, I think that you could, but my rotation doesn't really dictate me putting it on, um, like living crops or anything like that. We, we will put it on, plow it in, and then we could plant in the same day, uh, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You know, I usually ask this question up front, but I'm curious, like what, how did you find your way to Rodale? <laughs> um, so, uh, I grew up in Kingdom Prussia and I didn't have any farming background whatsoever. And to tell you a secret, um, when I was younger, I didn't know where food came from. And we went to, my family took me to Disney World and we went on one of these rides and we went through a hydroponic uh, growing lab where they show like lettuce and stuff growing. I was like, oh, there it is. That's how that works. Like to me, farms were like, they had cows and they smelled bad and that's it. We went there for field trips sometimes. And I guess this is where food came from until, uh, you know, I got a little bit more educated, uh, went to college, uh, really, really enjoyed learning about plants in my intro to botany class. Uh, I was really gearing up for a life in a lab and I was a, like a microbiology uh, specific major and I couldn't stand being in the lab and I couldn't stand looking through a microscope. Um, I, could, I certainly couldn't do that as a career. And so I just went into plants and I didn't really have a plan. I just really enjoyed learning about photosynthesis and, uh, and gravitropism and, and how plants are like affect all of society. <laughs> and so uh, I needed an internship to graduate. My advisor was a CSA member for a farmer leasing land at Rodale. So that was, that was a mouthful, but um, my advisor hooked me up with John and Amy Good, who were at Good Farm. They were leasing land here at Rodale on the property I'm at right now. So I've been on this property since about 2011 working for John and Amy. Um, they taught me how to farm. Um, I wasn't ready to open my own farm. I I forget how old I was. I worked for them for about three years. And uh, I was getting ready to do, uh, to apply for a lab where my wife worked. And, you know, I was really dragging my feet. I was really dreading it. I did not want to go do lab work, but I definitely needed to pay the bills. I wasn't ready to open my own business. So this was what made sense. And then, boom, Rodale had an opening for a position and I applied for it. And, um, you know, it was, it was for greenhouse manager. And I'll tell you another secret, um, I actually didn't get that job but they were impressed enough with the interview that they uh, hired me as a general laborer. And so I started here essentially as a farmhand or a farm laborer, and I've been working my way up, and now I'm a farm manager. That's great. Are there ways in which your biology background kind of help with your farming uh, processes? Like, Oh, yeah. Just, I mean, you know, nutrient cycling, um, nitrification, understanding nitrogen fixing from legumes, understanding respiration. Um, the cycles of the earth, you know, I really learned everything I could and I, it really stuck with me. So it assisted me a lot on in going into a research area and being able to have conversations with PhDs and consult them on their experiments. And, um, but also just knowing what's happening in the soil and in the plants, like, you know, it sprays around on the plant that's going to reduce bugs, but it's also going to reduce photosynthesis, you know, um, those things uh, were second nature to me. And so it was very helpful to have my background in biology. Um, our, uh, our CEO, Jeff Moyer, when he's talking about hay, he says the, the hay is perfect standing where it is and all you can do is mess it up, but we need to get it off the field. And that is a really good metaphor for plants in general. They're fine and they're doing great and they've been designed that way to do great by their own. Um, we are kind of molding that. I would say we're getting in the way and making it useful for us. But the reality is that the plant just does it on its own. So the less you mess with it, the better it's going to do. Um, that's, you know, specifically talking about photosynthesis, absorbing light, creating carbon, uh, sugars. For the rest of production, I would say it's less than that. Very farming is somewhat invasive on the earth. Uh, and we're kind of 
in charge of taking care of it, but also molding it to do our bidding, if you will. Um, so, yeah, sorry to dive into that, but photo, yeah, <laughs> photosynthesis, huh? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's one of my favorite subjects. I, I feel like there, and, and this isn't necessarily to push back, but maybe add to it, um, this idea of that we, you know, we want to step out of the way and uh, allow nature to do its thing. But sometimes we, some of the things that we do when we try to step out of the way, like in some people's minds, I'm sure like regular tillage steps out of the way because it makes such a fluffy ground for the roots to move around. Right. But that's not necessarily the best thing for, for photosynthetic activity. Um, so like, I'm curious, like when you're thinking about it, um, in term, you know, from the biological standpoint, and you can feel free to get as nerdy about it as you want. But I was just thinking like, like what is getting out of the way look like to you? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. So, so what is getting out of the way look like in regard to that? I would say that um, if we step back and think about that, the big picture is really just this balance of inserting ourselves, like I said, into these natural processes. So uh, we have winter, we come out of winter and all of a sudden the, it's warm and beautiful. It's time for us to create food. Uh, you know, nature isn't like here. This is a great spot. You can just plant this here and it'll be great. You know, it's harsh. It's a harsh world. It's a harsh reality. Um, we're putting plants that maybe don't belong in that area. So we have to protect them with row cover. Row cover gets in the way of a natural process, but that plant's going to die without it. So, um, you know, as farmers, like I said, we want to shepherd the land, but the harsh reality is that we are fighting against nature as well. Um, we kind of claim our little hill and we won't be knocked off of it. And we have to make sure that we're not destroying the hill in the process. I guess that's the best way that I can put it. Um, but it's, it's hard. You can't always step out of the way because you need to make food. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. And we're making food from plants that don't just naturally pop up, uh, magically in this area. They take, uh, like I said, shepherding, they take a facilitator to help them grow. And that's our job. And sometimes, you know, that, like I said, the balance between things. Tillage, is that great for the earth? Um, it's not great for the microbes in the soil or the earthworms, it's certainly not. Um, is it helpful to help me prep a bed for direct seeding? Absolutely. Could I direct seed into clover with uh, rutabagas? No, that would definitely not work. Um, so yeah, it's always this balance. Um, you're always trying to do the best you can for the soil, the community, the ecosystem, the earth. Uh, but knowing that this is an invasive process, you're simply just mitigating that damage. That's great. Well, Dan Kemper, I appreciate so much your time. Thank you for uh, taking a little time out of your day to talk to us about Rodale and your work. Not a problem at all. Yeah. And, um, you know, if anybody is interested in learning more, visit our website. We have a lot of educational material right on the site. Uh, we have an online transition class, and then we also have our farmer training. So uh, there's so much to learn here. There's so much to benefit by coming to the property. All right. If you enjoyed that episode, you can learn more about Dan and Rodale's work at the rodaleinstitute.org. I will put some links in the show notes. Also, make sure to pick up a copy of my new book, The Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com. The proceeds from that go to making more content like this podcast, like Growers Live, which just, like I said, got its own uh, podcast feed. So you can go to wherever you get your podcast and look up Growers Live and you can hear those just like a podcast. Also, No-Till Flowers podcast. We've got two more in the works and a bunch of videos coming all free, all because people are willing to support us on Patreon or on Venmo or, you know, by pre-ordering the book or whatever. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you're getting it and make sure to leave a review. But this week, all reviews must have a control review to minimize the effects of variables, but also so that other reviewers can more easily replicate that review and confirm the results. I think that's important. Big thanks, as always, to Jackson Roulette and Josh Satin for their help. Thank you to Willie Breeding for the theme tunes. Huge thanks, as always, to my wife and partner and friend and favorite human, Hannah Crabtree, for everything in the world. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Not, no, this was a lot of fun, man. I, had, I really enjoyed getting down and uh, talking about this stuff. Nobody ever asked about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. I.